Today we are going to interview some dentists. I'm Sheila Farrell. I'm a general dental practitioner and also a specialist practitioner. And I'm a member of the, uh, fellow of the faculty of general dental practice. Today I'm going to talk to Dame Margaret Seward. Dame Margaret, thank you very much for coming today. You have had a glittering career, if I may say so, as editor of the British Dental Journal, as editor, um, president of the British Dental Association, president of the General Dental Council, and finally, as chief dental officer for England. Can you tell us how you started? Um, I was brought up in a household uh, where my father was a single-handed general practitioner. Uh, I lived in the house. I breathed time dentistry uh, we had lots of patients coming in and out and the patients would arrive in agony and go out with lovely smiling faces and I thought gosh that's a nice uh, occupation to make people happy um, and I enjoyed making things also with my hands and I thought yes I will become a dentist like my father and that's how I what I in fact did and so you started where which which I went to the London Hospital mm -hmm. in Whitechapel. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being that my brother had studied medicine there and my father had studied there. My uncle perhaps was more sensible. He had gone to Bart's, but I decided to stick with the London and that's what I did. So I entered dental school and there were very few uh, women in uh, mm. training and we were viewed as a little bit of uh, a novelty. <laughs> well, clearly your father had a great influence on you. Who else had influences on your life or through your career? Well, my uh, Gordon, yes, who is yes. my husband now, and we celebrate our golden wedding in a, a couple of years' time. Uh, but he was senior registrar at the London Hospital, and um, mm. I was resident houseman, and we therefore were in theatres quite a bit together. And uh, I didn't realise, but we were getting a little bit more close than just work. And that's how we, uh, we married uh, very soon after I had left the London. And as a result, Gordon, right through my career, has been a great influence in that he not only has been very supportive, um, but also very committed that women should be able to follow a full career in, de in whatever profession and obviously in dentistry. Therefore, he was very, very influential in helping me back um, after we had had the children and I had time out. Um, other people were, I must admit, that Jerry Leatherman, who you would mm -hmm. remember yes. was um, executive director of the uh, FDI, that's the International Dental Federation, was a great influence. He did things which um, I tried to act out throughout my, my life in uh, dentistry and in other, other spheres, in that he said, I will introduce you, take you to a meeting, for example, in America, come to America to the meeting of the American Dental Association. I will introduce you to all the leading people that you should meet. Then it's up to you to follow up and uh, find out and, and, uh, and so on. And then I've always tried now to do the same to other, for other people because it's making that initial ice-breaking movement into a big uh, group, whether it's a special mm. society or whatever. When you're very new, you're a bit timid to actually talk to people and it's really nice to have a mentor yes. like that. Yes, so how did you become editor of the British Dental Journal? Well, I didn't really mean to become it. <laughs> um, the job had been advertised, they had uh, held interviews and nobody had been appointed. Uh, and it was on the third advertisement. And um, I was actually <coughs> very busy at the time uh, on the women survey in 1975, where we were looking at the contribution of women in dentistry. And what happened when they stepped off the career ladder and why couldn't they, they get back on? Was there any retraining? Which of course there wasn't. Was there any maternity provision? Well of course there wasn't. 
And we were doing this survey, so I had no intention of applying for any other job. It was still going on. And uh, I was approached um, by the BDA, and they said, what about being editor of the BDJ? And I said, well, me? I don't know anything about editing. And they said, oh, well, well you, you know, you can go on a course. Oh, I said, that'd be very interesting. So, I mean, I'd written articles, but I didn't know anything about journals. So I said, well, where would I go? So they said, London College of Printing. So I said, well, fine, OK. So I went off to the London College of Printing and learnt a, a little bit of how to live and produce journals. And yes, I was rather amused to read in your book that you said you had to dress down to be there. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Do you, you know where it is? It's in the Elephant and Castle, which isn't a sort of very salubrious part no. of uh, <laughs> London. And uh, all the people there were youngsters out of just graduates learning how to edit journals. And uh, I was suddenly uh, thrown in the deep end. So you're absolutely right. I couldn't go dressed up for work in uh, wherever or in the in practice. Street, and no. Gordon said, what are you going off in your garden clothes for? <laughs> <laughs> you then became um, the um, president of the British Dental Association, and then immediately after that, president of the General Dental Council. Now, what do you think makes a good leader? Well, um, a, a good leader is someone who obviously um, has very positive thoughts, knows, uh, has a vision, um, is determined to follow that through. Um, and also, I think it's important to say, in a leader, you've got to be prepared to take the challenges. Um, there are, there's no such thing as problems. They're all opportunities. And as a leader, you've got to be prepared to stand your ground, but also uh, recognise there are lots of other opinions and take those into consideration. And I just must add that I do believe that when you mention about, you rolled them a bit together, but the BDJ, I was approached. But the GDC, of course, when I first election. got on it in 1976, was by election. Mm. And I think this is one thing that women are particularly reticent to do, is to stand in an election for appointment to something in case they fail. And unless they stand, they mustn't sort of whinge from the sideline. They're not involved. But a leader, once you're there, you've got to listen. You've got to, you've got to engage with people. You've got to make sure that they trust you. There's no use going around nattering um, and sort of, you know, giving away confidences. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, important. To, so uh, what are your know. personal drivers? What do you... Especially well, to have the vision, yes, um, to want to change things, yes. and for example, on the GDC, obviously I was particularly um, anxious that uh, we should register all the, um, as they were called then, auxiliary staff, the professionals complementary to dentistry, or now they're called dentists, comp you know, <laughs> dental professionals uh, complement. I mean, you know, what we talk about is the therapists, the hygienists, the technicians, the dental nurses, all registered with the GDC. So it's a real team effort. And that is the first group of health professionals ever registered, all with one regulatory body. So that was a, a vision, really. Yes, yes, and you've had that for many years. Yeah. yeah. So what are your immediate challenges? Well, the immediate challenges were, <laughs> of course, I've left the department, yes. Yes. Um, which was a great challenge in itself and um, had to uh, get a try, not get, but try to mm. engage the profession and to get... Um, that the government to realise we needed a little bit more interplay and the contract. And we had something wonderful set up, which you know strategically, called Options for Change. And everybody was signed up to this. But um, unfortunately, that didn't actually uh, come to fruition. It was rather um, uh, cut off in its prime. Mm. But it beginning to show signs of uh, returning. But so the challenge then um, was to try to get that back on uh, the conveyor belt.
but as far as my own challenges, which I think you're referring to as my writing of the book. Absolutely, your excellent um, um, autobiography. And it, I was persuaded, I, I was very reticent to do that to start with, um, because I thought, well, who's interested? And secondly, having spent a lifetime of meeting deadlines and so on, I didn't really want to spend retirement at all so involved. I, um, I, I finally capitulated when Gordon, who was very, very keen that I should do it, um, he said, now look, you know, you've filled all the cupboards in the flat where we've now moved to in Bournemouth, um, and we'd really like to have the space back. Would you like to get rid of all your files and everything? <laughs> and then uh, if you write your book, you can get rid of all your files. So I said, OK. But apart from that, serious point was that I have been very, very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. And that I've seen a lot um, through my various appointments you've mentioned. And each one's given me a different um, window into what's happening. And I thought bringing it all together, it's like a social history of dentistry. And interwoven in that, I think people can see where I've come from, that um, what you've got to do is you've got to grasp any opportunity that appears. Mm. And that I was really very, very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And you know, I would never change my career no. I, I, mm. I just love dentistry and trying to deliver better oral health. I remember to Gordon saying that you were very good at relaxing and switching off. Is this your secret to getting a good uh, balance? With well, my work? work life balance, as they call it, which always sounds a bit like a tightrope, doesn't it? Yes, um, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, we, we enjoy dinner parties, I enjoy cooking in the home, we enjoy going out, walking. Uh, friends are very, very important. Um, in fact, I call it the three F's, you know, family, fun, which you have with the family, and friends, which is fun with your family. So it's all the, the, the F's, and, and if you just do that in the right balance, you can uh, keep an even keel. Workaholics don't have any place. They burn out, yes. and I don't think it benefits anybody to be a workaholic. So would you still encourage women into dentistry today? Oh yes, I, I think it's a very mm. satisfying career. Mm. Um, it's got different challenges. There's no doubt about it that in the National Health Service, um, it is very difficult mm. to um, keep up the pressure for some people. Um, but there are marvelous opportunities. There's new techniques, new materials, mm. new uh, ways of thinking. And it's like every career. Um, it's what you make it. Quite. Mm. And uh, no, I, I fully agree for women to go into dentistry. Well, thank you very much for talking to us and for being such an excellent role model. Thank you.